Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Thamar Al Isa. I'm a consultant endocrinologist, um, head of division at Jabir Al Ahmed Hospital, and also vice president of the Kuwait Osteoporosis Society. Uh, welcome to our seminar. Um, we are delighted to have you here as an audience to this uh, online learning um, activity. Uh, it's Osteoporosis Learning Essentials. Um, in this process, we try to uh, dedicate uh, this session for an ongoing learning of medical information, even though the world is going through the COVID-19 pandemic, but still we have many patients who are suffering from many chronic illnesses that we should not forget. And uh, one of these issues that we'd like to concentrate on today is osteoporosis. So um, we have uh, two dear colleagues of me, uh, Dr. Shayma Alanizi, um, who is uh, We'll uh, talk today um, about one of parts of the osteoporosis essential. Uh, we also have Dr. Ali Di'i. He's also going to talk about a different part of the uh, osteoporosis. So uh, without much delay, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Shayma Anizi. She's a, a senior endocrinologist at Al-Adan Hospital, so also a member of the Kuwait Osteoporosis Society. And she will be talking today about, uh, uh, about diagnosis and screening for patients with uh, osteoporosis. So, Dr. Shema, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tamer, for the nice presentation, and thanks to Amgen for this opportunity. Um, today, we will talk about osteoporosis definition, uh, epidemiology, what are the causes of osteoporosis, and what are the complications. We'll talk about clinical evaluation, including history, examination, laboratory assessment. And the diagnosis of osteoporosis, the rule of Frax and DEXA. And we'll talk finally about bone health and fracture prevention during COVID 19. Uh, what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis literally means porous bone. Uh, it is a disease in which the density and quality of bone are reduced. Osteoporosis is characterized by a low bone mass, microarchitectural disruption, and skeletal, uh, skeletal fragility, resulting in decreased bone strength and an increase in risk of fracture. Uh, currently, it is estimated that we have over 200 million people worldwide suffering from osteoporosis. Approximately 30 of all postmenopausal women have osteoporosis in the United States and in Europe. At least 40% of these women and 15 to 30% of men will sustain one or more fragility fracture in their remaining lifetime. Aging of populations worldwide will be responsible for a major increase in incidence of osteoporosis in uh, postmenopausal women. Uh, this is a map showing the prevalence of osteoporosis in the Middle East. So uh, one in every three women and one in every five men over the age of uh, 50 will experience osteoporosis, osteoporotic fracture. So the incidence is almost 9 million new osteoporotic fractures annually. So it occurs at a rate of one every three seconds. Often there are no symptoms until the first fracture occurs. The most common fracture associated with osteoporosis occurs in the hip, spine, and uh, the wrist, which is called Cull's fracture. What causes osteoporosis? I'm sure you are all familiar about the bone remodeling. We have the osteoblast responsible for bone resorption, and osteo osteoclast responsible for bone resorption, and osteoblast for bone formation, and that results in new bone. Uh, when we have a mismatch between bone formation and bone resorption, in the case we have more bone resorption than bone formation, the bone will become osteoporotic and will have increased fragility risk and fracture. So what are the risk factors for osteoporosis? Uh, we have advanced age, long-term glucocorticoid therapy, low body weight, less than 58 kgs, uh, parental history of hip fracture, which is very important, uh, cigarette smoking, excess alcohol intake, race, uh, race is ethnicity, which is higher risk in white adults, and a history of previous fracture. In all these cases, um, these risk factors validate a screening for osteoporosis. What are the complications of osteoporosis? Fractures are the most frequent and serious complication of osteoporosis, often occurs in the spine or hip. 
the bones that directly support your weight. Hip fractures and wrist fractures from falls are common, which are fragility fractures. Compression fractures of the spine can cause severe pain and require a long recovery. If many, patients may lose several inches of height as the posture becomes stooped, and that may result in kyphosis or a doger's hump, as you can see here. Of those who have uh, previously had an osteoporotic fracture, 85% will have a subsequent fracture. Mortality is 31% uh, uh, higher in men and 17% higher in women following a hip fracture. 33% of patients require long-term care replacement following a hip fracture. At age of 50, uh, 50 years old women, uh, year old women, lifetime risk of dying from hip fracture is equal to the risk of dying from breast cancer, which both equals to 2.8%, which is high. This figure can show you the increased uh, mortality rate in both women and men following osteoporotic fracture and more in men than women. Now we'll move to clinical evaluation. We start by history, physical examination, and laboratory assessment. As I mentioned before, in early stage, usually there are no symptoms, so it's called a silent disease. There might be a spontaneous or low trauma, trauma fracture. There may be back pain due, due to spinal compression. If several vertebrae break, may develop doger's hump, a loss of height. We also have, we need to ask about family history of fracture, low body weight, we should ask about uh, rheumatoid arthritis. You will be surprised. Many patients will mention that they have rheumatoid arthritis. But when you dig deeply in the history, you will know they are, uh, they are having like osteoarthritis or they are not really diagnosed by rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, history of hyperthyroidism, for example, celiac disease. And we should ask about medications, steroids, and proton pump inhibitors and other medications. And of course, smoking and alcohol intake. So for the laboratory assessment, we have a routine evaluation, which includes a uh, complete blood count with uh, ESR, C-reactive protein, uh, renal function test, liver function test, and then we can do thyroid function test, 25-hydroxyvitamin D, 24-hour urine for calcium and creatinine, and in men, we can do gonadal function. There are some specialized testing for secondary causes, if you are suspecting a secondary cause. Uh, we should do intact uh, parathyroid hormone, urine-free cortisol if you are suspecting Cushing syndrome, and you should rule out celiac disease if suspected, serum protein electrophoresis to, to rule out, and the urine uh, protein electrophoresis to rule out multiple myeloma, serum iron and ferritin if you are suspecting hemochromatosis. Uh, this is the form I use in my osteoporosis clinic in Adan Hospital. I mentioned the name, the date of birth of the patient, the sex, nationality, height and weight, and any previous history. We should ask about smoking, for example, family history of fracture, low body weight, rheumatoid arthritis, hyperthyroidism, early menopause. Uh, many women have their menopause before the age of 45, and they will not mention it unless you ask about it. Uh, we should know if there is any history of diabetes, organ transplant, increased caffeine intake, uh, systemic steroids, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, gastrointestinal bypass, uh, history of recurrent falls, growth hormone deficiency, Cushing disease. Uh, we ask about the drugs the patient taking, dietary intake of calcium, and previous fragility fractures, which is a fall from standing height or less. And then this is the second page. We have the blood investigations, which we mentioned. And each uh, visit, we can compare the investigations. Then we have the uh, DIXA uh, scan results. If done, we can write the T-score and BMD, and then uh, compare it if there is any improvement. And finally, we have the FRAX, 10-year hip fracture probability, and the plan for this patient. For the diagnosis of osteoporosis, we start by identifying a fragility fracture in the spine, hip, or uh, two or more other fractures. If it is positive, you treat. If it is negative, you will move to the second step, which is estimating the risk of fracture by FRAX. 
If it is positive, we will treat the patient. If it is negative and required, we move to the third st stage, which is evaluating the MD by DEXA. So uh, for fragility fracture, we have here hip fracture, which occurs from uh, uh, falling from a standing position. Also, we have a vertebral fracture over here and here, which might cause uh, shortness of the patient. And the vertebral fracture is consistent with the diagnosis of osteoporosis and requires a medical treatment, even in the absence of bone density diagnosis. Then we move to the FRAX. What is FRAX? FRAX is a fracture risk assessment tool. It is a scientifically validated risk assessment tool, which has now been integrated into an increasing number of national osteoporosis guidelines around the world. The FRAX tool, ha tool has been developed to evaluate fracture risk of patients. It is based on individual patient models that integrate the risk associated with clinical risk factor as well as bone mineral density. Uh, currently, the FRAX tool uh, includes uh, 64 countries and about 6 million calculations done yearly in 173 countries. The FRAX algorithm give the gives the 10 years probability of fracture, major osteoporotic fracture in the spine, forearm, hip, or shoulder fracture, and also the 10 years probability of hip fracture. Integrate the risk associated with clinical risk factors and bone mineral density at the femoral neck, which is optional. So this is the FRAX website. Go to the Middle East and Africa, and then you choose Kuwait. You will have this calculation tool, which includes the age. It should be between 40 and 90 years old, the sex of the patient, the weight in kgs, the height in centimeter, if the patient have any previous fracture, uh, parent fracture uh, hip, current smoking, glucocorticoid use, which is uh, prednisolone, for example, 5 mg per day uh, or equivalent for uh, three months or above, uh, history of rheumatoid arthritis or type 2, two diabetes, uh, secondary osteoporosis like type 1 diabetes, alcohol, uh, three or more units per day, and finally, femoral neck. Uh, BMD in gram per centimeter square, and that's optional if the patient did the DEXA. So risk factors in FRAX tool include the age between the age of 40 and 90 years, the sex of the patient, the weight, um, and the height of the patient. Previous fracture should be fragility fracture, uh, which is falling from standing height. Of course, hands and feet and ankle fractures are not uh, fragility fractures. Uh, parental history of hip fracture, which is very important. Current cigarette smoking. And as I mentioned, the use of glucocorticoid of prednisolone, uh, 5 milligram uh, per day or equivalent for three or more months. Rheumatoid arthritis or type 2 diabetes. If we have type 2 diabetes, we put it, uh, we take in the rheumatoid arthritis box secondary osteoporosis, and alcohol, three or more units per day, femoral neck BMD, which is optional. So now we'll concentrate on the secondary causes of osteoporosis. These include type 1 diabetes, osteogenesis imperfecta in adults, untreated long-standing hyperthyroidism, hypogonadism, premature menopause of the age of 45 years or below, chronic malnutrition, malabsorption, chronic liver disease, organ transplantation, prolonged immobility, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. What are the advantages of FRAX? It's an easily accessible web-based tool. You can download it on your mobile phone. You can enter if you have internet through your laptop. It's the only model based on extensive data on multiple cohorts. FRAX will help clinicians identify individuals who need osteoporosis treatment while also screening out those who do not require osteoporosis treatment. Now we move to the third step, which is DEXA scan. DEXA stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorbiometry. Uh, it is the gold standard for BMD measurement. Um, we measure the hip, the spine, and the forearm. 
So which skeletal sites should we measure? The region of interest. Uh, for the spine, we measure from L1 to L4. For the hip, we measure uh, total hip and the femoral neck. So um, uh, please, uh, for, the, for measuring for the hip, don't take words triad or trochanter. These, are should, uh, these parameters should not be used for diagnosis. And the forearm, the distal one-third of the non-dominant forearm of the radius. Uh, if the hip or spine cannot be measured, if the patient having hyperparathyroidism or if he is very obese. We need two of these three above sites to be measured for proper reporting. What DEXA measures? It measures bone mineral density calculated in gram per centimeter square. It measures the T-score, which compares the patient BMD with the young normal mean BMD. And also it measures the Z-score, which compares the young patient's BMD with the same age normal mean BMD. What are the contraindications to DEXA scan? We have pregnancy, GI contrast within the last 72 hours, and uh, weight over 114 kg. For the WHO diagnostic classification, we have a normal bone density, which is from one to uh, less than minus one. From uh, minus one to less than minus 2.5, it's called low bone mass. Uh, osteoporosis is diagnosed from minus 2.5 and less. So osteoporotic fractures and bone mineral density, most fractures occurs in the osteopenic range, which is from minus one to minus 2.5. Sometimes you can have high risk of fracture with normal T-score. For example, for this patient, the T-score is minus one. So according to DEXA, we don't need to treat this patient. But when we apply FRAX, like let us say this patient is 70 years old female, with a weight of 88 kgs and height of 160 centimeters, uh, with a parenteral fracture hip history, and she's on glucocorticoids, she has rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, she has type 1 diabetes. When we calculate the major osteoporotic risk fracture, we don't take the hip, we take the major osteoporotic fracture from the Quetic guidelines, it is 12, and this is indication for treatment in this patient. So that tells us the difference between depending only on the T-score and when we uh, take into account the factor. This is another example for a 60-year-old woman. If she doesn't have a history of parental hip fracture, no rheumatoid arthritis, no previous fracture, her uh, 10 years probability of major fracture is 9.9. .9. This number will be more if she have rheumatoid arthritis, she have a previous fracture, it will jump to 21%. FRAX-based Kuwaiti osteoporosis guidelines, we have a lower assessment threshold, inter intervention threshold, and upper assessment threshold. The lower assessment threshold, it is the 10-year probability of a major osteoporotic fracture for a woman with no risk factors. And then we have the intervention threshold. It is a 10-year probability of major osteoporotic fracture for a woman with a prior fracture. And the upper assessment threshold, it is 1.2, the intervention threshold. This is the FRAX-based Kuwaiti osteoporosis guidelines. It was done in 2018. So whom we treat? We see a postmenopausal woman and men aged 50 and above. If they have a history of uh, fragility fracture, spine, hip, or two or more other fractures, then we, we need to treat the patient with or without DEXA. We can do DEXA just to compare with the treatment after treating the patient if there is any improvement. If the patient has no history of fragility fracture, we apply FRAX. For the FRAX, we have, uh, if it is below the assessment threshold, we take the major osteoporotic risk, as I mentioned, by FRAX. If it is lower than the assessment threshold, uh, you reassure and repeat FRAX after five years or when clinical condition change. If it is above the upper assessment threshold, as we mentioned, you treat the patient and you do DEXA, with or without DEXA. If it is between uh, the assessment thresholds, 
you need to do DEXA, and then you see the intervention threshold. So the intervention threshold used if the fracture risk is between the assessment threshold, we measure DEXA and then reassess the probability. And we check if it is below intervention threshold, then you reassure the patient and repeat FRAX and DEXA after three years. If it is above these numbers, then uh, you treat the patient. So uh, now we move to the last part, what to know about bone health and fracture prevention during COVID-19. Um, the patient should remove all dangers at their home. Uh, they should stay physically active. They stay two meters away from each other, uh, eat healthy food and take supplements if needed to get enough calcium and vitamin D, stick with the, their osteoporosis medication and get enough medication for this period. Um, uh, they should, uh, bone density testing can be postponed and uh, speak with the, their doctors about the possibility of telephone and video visits. And uh, they should maintain uh, contact with family and friends by telephone, emails. Physical isolation doesn't have to be social isolation. And this ends my part. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully you. see you in the avenues. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hashim. I appreciate uh, your presentation. A uh, uh, very good review about the basics of uh, screening and diagnosis of osteoporosis based on the FRAX criteria. So I think we can move on to the next speaker. We will leave the Q&As at the end, and I have received several uh, questions uh, that you uh, have sent, and we'll go over them uh, after the second uh, presentation is completed and we'll discuss them um, in, in very details. Um, I'm pleasant to present uh, Dr. Ali Di'i, he's uh, also a friend and colleague. Uh, he's a consultant dermatologist at the hospital in Jabir al-Ahmed Hospital. And um, he will talk about the clinical management uh, of osteoporosis. Um, and uh, uh, go ahead, Dr. Ali. Well, uh, thank you, Famer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashama, for a wonderful presentation. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizing committee uh, for such an event. Uh, this is my disclosure for Amgen. So in order to treat any medical condition, uh, I have a philosophy that I have learned from my practice that we need to personalize our patient. Using the personalized medicine, each patient should be dealt differently based on the science, based on the knowledge that we have, and based on the opinion, based on the clinical history, physical exam, then we put a plan for each patient. When we go to osteoporosis guidelines, there are more than 33 guidelines in the literature that's been approved, and recently in 2018, Kuwaiti osteoporosis guidelines. So this is the science part, this is the knowledge part that everybody can be accessed and read. So our uh, role is basically to translate those uh, uh, informations into a clinical practice to individualize our patients. Risk factors for osteoporosis, the reason uh, Dr. Shemashi spoke about, we need to prevent the fractures because the fractures they are bad on the human beings, they cause uh, mortality and they cause morbidity as well. It affects uh, not merely the lives, also the health economic of any country. So in order to risk assessment, uh, not only for a treatment, uh, also for the choice of uh, which uh, treatment method shall we use our patient. Any patient, she will, they will come to me, they will come to the clinic by a car. Car is uh, a bad vehicle. Uh, it killed my beloved one. But uh, what shall I do? I, I should use it every day. I drive my wife, my kids, beloved one as well. We take, all of us, we take precautions. We say our players, uh, we wear our seat belts, follow the Ministry of Interior Regulation in order to prevent us from crash and causing any accident. Uh, uh, same thing, I will apply it for my assessment tool, for risk assessment for osteoporosis, also the choice for a treatment. So I'll ask the patient, if uh, the patient, she comes to my clinic, I'll ask her, well, if everybody in the clinic stand up on my desk and uh, we close our eyes and fell down. Who has the risk of developing a fracture? This is a really a practical question that we need to be addressed. So we'd like to prevent falls, we'd like to prevent the fractures, and we'd like to choose the best uh, treatment which has the best efficacy and less uh, side effect. 
there are lots of tools for assessment for bone mineral density. We can be used by uh, different methods. Also, Dr. Shema mentioned about the facts or uh, the bone mineral density scores by the T-scores, the WHO. So osteoporosis, it's a normal uh, process in human beings, especially in women, postmenopausal, with increasing age, they will put you in a risk factor for a fragile bone. There is, uh, based on uh, 2018 guidelines by uh, Kuwait Association, or, uh, by the Kuwait Osteoporosis Guideline, uh, if we evaluate the patient and we, we would like to treat them, there are two ways of treating them, non-pharmacological and pharmacological. So the non-pharmacological, the idea of uh, treatment is to make sure that you have risk of falling, to make sure your uh, muscles are strong, so when you fall, you protect your skeletal system. So discontinue or limit smoking, alcohol, and caffeine, uh, weight-bearing exercises, they are important in order to, be, to have stronger muscles. Uh, measure and reduce the risk of falling, for example, using uh, glasses, hearing aids, uh, gait balance exercises, and individualize the patient are important for the non-pharmacological. Most importantly, the education of, and public awareness and also education of our colleagues who deal with such a topic. Pharmacological treatment, they are important to have two important things, one vitamin D and calcium. So vitamin D deficiency need to be replaced and calcium should be adequate regarding each patient. Uh, this is a real life uh, situation uh, for uh, most of our patients. I will talk to, to about, it, about it in the next few slides. A most impor uh, another important topic is the sar uh, sarcopenia, which is basically uh, another medical condition that comes with people who's old, who had a loss of muscle, loss of function. It's associated with a risk of fall. Sometimes as a physician, we uh, forget about this important uh, disease or uh, nature of a disease. So we have to ask our patient to take care of themselves, to have a stronger body, uh, to be uh, medicated if they have a chronic conditions, uh, to take care of their diet and the lifestyles in order to have good muscles to prevent falls and the fractures. Going back to vitamin D, vitamin D usually, if they have a replacement, I always put this example in my clinic. The patients come comes to you with a vitamin D deficiency, I just put them, as I told them, listen, in the building that we, in the clinic or in your house, you have a water tank. If this water tank is empty, you need to replace it with a large amount of water. So you bring a tanker and this guy, he fill all the tank. That's what we do if we have vitamin D deficiency, just like less than uh, the requirement we need between 75 to 250. So if the patient has a low vitamin D, we need to replace them with a high dose, either by the intramuscular dosage or oral weekly dosage for 8 to 12 weeks. Then what will happen if we leave, if we leave it after a couple of months, this storage will go down. Go back to the tank uh, example. If I will, we will use the water, then the water will we run out of water. So what shall we do? We will repeat the same thing. We don't want to repeat that for the patient every six months or every year. They would like to replace with vitamin D. We need to keep our good job, like the minister of uh, water. They supply you with the water supply every day. That's what we need to supply our patient if we achieve our goal of good vitamin D. We can replace vitamin D either orally by 1,000 by 1,000 to 2,000 units, uh, or weekly by 10,000 international units, or even monthly 5,000, uh, uh, 50,000 international units. So the idea is to replace vitamin D and to have a good vitamin D level as well. Calcium is an important thing also. Calcium and vitamin D, they are the materials that the bone needed uh, to uh, uh, replace itself uh, to be uh, healthy and uh, active all the time. So vitamin, uh, sorry, uh, regarding the calcium, it's important for the patient to know their requirement. And they're very nice website like Osteoporosis Canada where they do a calcium calculator. So you ask the patient regarding their age, sex, uh, their breastfeeding or not, they will go through their normal diet and they will give you an estimate of how much calcium they take from the diet. We prefer the calcium to be taken from the diet and if there is a deficiency, we would like to replace it by oral intake. We have to keep in mind some, some patients that we replace them with calcium or like oral calcium. Uh, 
the absorption from the GI tract, if they are taking uh, proton pump inhibitor, or also if they have other medical conditions, just like kidney stones. So we are very cautious regarding replacing them with the calcium. Other medications, uh, rather than calcium and vitamin D, there are many agents uh, can be used uh, for osteoporosis, either anti-resorbative agents like biphosphonate, uh, rank ligand inhibitors, uh, denosumab, uh, calcitonin, uh, estrogen uh, like hormonal therapy or uh, estrogen. Uh, we can use tissue estrogen or inhibitor which is a new uh, drug that's been approved by the FDA, parathyroid analog or, or PTH analog as well. So uh, let's just stick with the Kuwaiti uh, guidelines. So first choice here is by the alphabetic. So we evaluate the patients and we, you know, we will discuss with them what is the best thing for them regarding treatment of osteoporosis and minimizing the side effect. So if the patient has a fragility fracture, uh, especially spinal fracture, we prefer to give them uh, anabolic agent uh, like the teraparatide. If the patient they uh, have a vertebral or nerve vertebral fracture or hip fracture of the arm, we can use biphosphonate either by oral weekly, alendronate, or uh, denosumab, which is a subcutaneous injection every two, uh, every six months, or the nitronic acid, which is a yearly IV injection. Also, we have other options of uh, abedronate, which is a biphosphonate, which we can give in every month or every three months and the Rifoxivine Evista uh, as well. Then we have to evaluate the patient after five years, which method are we using and what is our trajectory in such cases. I would like to mention that combination therapy is not advised due to uh, evidence and danger to our patients. So again, uh, we'll go for the science, we follow the guidelines, we think of our opinion and we personalize our uh, uh, patients. Uh, so I would like to talk about uh, denosumab, which is uh, uh, has a pharmacological property. It's a rank ligand uh, protein. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's been given subcutaneously in patients who would like to uh, give it to them. Uh, usually in Kuwait, we give it in a hospital setting and in some few uh, polyclinics uh, as well. Uh, mechanism of action, uh, as Dr. Shema uh, said before, so our our target either on the osteoblast or on the oste osteoclast, so it's uh, denosumab acts on the osteoclast mainly. If we'd like to compare denosumab to uh, biphosphonate, so it's effective or yes, it's because it's been approved in most uh, of the guidelines, especially in the Kuwaiti guidelines, uh, if we compare it to uh, biphosphonate, it's uh, effective in uh, preventing uh, osteoporosis and the treatment of osteoporosis as well. Patient uh, satisfaction. So if you ask the patient if they are taking a weekly medication or if they are taking every six months, yes, they will tell you, well, six months is uh, handy. Uh, it's better for me. Uh, I will come, I take my dose. So I will have a reminder on the calendar, so it is uh, satisfactory to the patient. Uh, if we'd like to compare the cost between Dilusimab and the biphosphonate, uh, there are a few studies comparing that in the States and in Japan. If you'd like to calculate, if you do the math, you will find the price is nearly uh, similar. Regarding the safety, this is a monoclonal antibody, so monoclonal antibody now, uh, there are a few classes of medication, we use them in our field of pharmacology, like a biological or a smart medication, it's been used now also in different uh, diseases, just like migraine, they have a monoclonal antibody, lowered, uh, lipid lowering agent, monoclonal antibody, and also in this uh, osteoporosis. So it is a relatively a safe uh, a drug, uh, it doesn't cause a serious adverse event, event or infection in a normal population. Uh, we can also use denosumab in people who have low GFR. Uh, which have, uh, which is a very uh, interesting topic in people who has a chronic kidney disease. Uh, they may have a problem with their bones and they are causing, they are prone to uh, fragility uh, fracture easily. Regarding the management of uh, osteoporosis, uh, that's the guidelines for osteoporosis guidelines in uh, patients was on uh, glucocorticoids. I see most of the patients regarding their glucocorticoid due to the uh, rheumatic disease I deal with. And it, it's been there, uh, a part of the biphosphonate. Also, you can use the 
Mozilla for uh, management of such uh, patients. And uh, for, this is uh, just to put in mind that people who's taken steroid, uh, this is from the American College of Pharmacology guideline. So patients who's been on uh, steroid, the frax of them it should be higher. Like if you carpet the frax, you have to adjust it uh, for steroid and it uh, will be higher. For example, if I calculated and uh, the hip fracture uh, is uh, 2%, uh, percent, it will be increased to 2.4%. Uh, person. Uh, coming back again to the facts, uh, people who uh, have a long-term osteoporosis, uh, uh, if they have long-term glucocorticoid and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, also they are in the risk of developing osteoporosis. So we use uh, denosumab in our field of rheumatology on people who have rheumatoid arthritis and also on other uh, monoclonal antibody biological agents, and uh, we found uh, no serious uh, uh, risk of opportunistic infection or uh, interaction between those medications. So it's relatively safe in our uh, patients. Uh, also, it has a good uh, probability of uh, protecting our bone from uh, erosion, and it has also uh, an indirect effect on the bone uh, resorption and uh, resorption of the function in our uh, patients. Uh, what about the duration of uh, treatment? Usually, as I said before, it's usually the guideline. You evaluate the patient for five years. After the five years, you stop and uh, evaluate, rethink. Some people would like to extend the treatment to up to uh, 10 years. Uh, in some patients, maybe we exceed uh, 10 years. Uh, the idea of a treatment is uh, to reduce the risk of a fracture as much as possible, not uh, merely by medical treatment, also by the non-pharmacological physiotherapy, lifestyle, adequate uh, vitamin D and uh, calcium. Uh, I'd like to thank you, and uh, I guess uh, let's move uh, Dr. Uh, um. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, really appreciate it. Very good review. Thank you so much for that. Um, really appreciate the presentation that was done today. Uh, very well described in terms of um, screening and of osteoporosis. Uh, we have plenty of questions, and uh, good we have enough time, inshallah, to go over them as much as we can. Um, I just have one question that is, I was looking at the list of the questions, and none of the questions um, was asking the one that is actually probably will affect a lot of people during this time right now. And um, I will direct the question to Dr. Ali first. Uh, based on the uh, COVID-19 situation right now, you can realize that uh, many clinics are already not operational and uh, many patients on a chronic uh, treatment for osteoporosis, they might uh, have an issue with delay of their dosing. So if I have a patient or anybody else has a patient who on regular schedule um, intravenous or subcutaneous dosing of, uh, of uh, osteoporosis therapy, namely um, uh, zelindronic acid or, uh, uh, or denosumab, so what's the idea of delaying this therapy uh, until the COVID situation is, is more optimal and clinics um, opera are operational again? Uh, well, uh, from practical point of view, some, uh, some clinic is still operating, like uh, for example, in Amiri, Mubarak, uh, I think a few hospitals, if the patient follows with the rheumatology infusion room, we still we have an access for IV or subcutaneous uh, medication. So this is a from practical point of view. From the guidance and the recommendation, uh, we don't, I don't find any risk of infection, especially linked to COVID-19 with uh, such medications or any viral illness or bacterial from the previous uh, experience with those medications. Uh, American College of Rheumatology, they suggest delaying denosumab every eight months so you can delay it not every six months you can delay it for a couple of months and uh, see uh, regarding bifosphonate you can switch them to uh, oral if, uh, if they are really in high risk with adequate vitamin d and uh, uh, calcium okay good uh, thank you so much and um, for dr Shema, i might direct this question for you if you have a patient who you are treating for osteoporosis and it's time, it's due time now to have a follow-up DEXA scan uh, based on a therapy. Uh, and since the majority of the hospitals not operational for outpatient settings, uh, is it okay to delay the follow-up DEXA scan? Uh, yes, Dr. Tamil, I think it's okay we can delay it for a few months. 
and then we can do it later on after finishing from this dilemma with COVID-19. So there is no harm in delaying it a little bit. Okay, um, I think that's a very sufficient uh, answer. Thank you, Dr. Shema. Uh, we might go through the questions and see um, uh, how we can um, answer them. Um, one of the questions I can direct that to Dr. Ali, uh, what's the ideal period to do a follow-up DEXA scan on a patient that you've already uh, been treating with, uh, with porosity process? Usually we do it uh, after uh, one and a half to two years. So I, I'll do it every two years and evaluate the patients. Meanwhile, I'll ask the patient if they have uh, change in their medical condition or risk factors or they develop the new diseases, change their treatment. We maybe reconsider a shorter period. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shaima, this, um, this question might be, um, uh, you, you could answer, answer I'm sure, is that, why would a low testosterone level or hypogonadism in general, how is it would cause osteoporosis in men? What's the pathophysiology? Uh, dec uh, decreased test hypogonad uh, hypogonadism and decreased testosterone in men, it will be, uh, affect the bone remodeling. Uh, so the bone will be weaker, will have more osteoclast activity, less osteoblast activity, leading to osteoporosis in men. And it is a reversible cause. So when we pick it up, it is a secondary cause that it easily can be picked up and uh, the patient can improve after treatment with testosterone. Okay, so we understand that um, uh, testosterone is an anabolic hormone and it's, uh, it's, it's one of those effects that, um, that delivers anabolic effect on the bone and, and, and we would like to have a sufficient amount of testosterone whenever we treat someone with hypogonadism. Uh, Dr. Hashima, also you can answer these questions. This probably will uh, direct to the, uh, the FRAC system or, or the scouting system. Um, if you ask about the family history of, uh, of, uh, of a fracture, what kind of a, fr a fracture you would want uh, for, the, uh, for the family history and also for the patient themselves when you ask them about the history of a, of a fracture, what kind of a fracture you're looking for in the family and in the patient themselves. Uh, for the family, we ask of a femoral fracture or if they have a history of osteoporosis in general. Uh, for the person itself, we ask a history of any fragility fracture of course, we exclude the hands, feet, and ankle fracture, and we exclude the stressed fracture of repeated injuries. Um, any other fracture could be a fragility fracture, but we don't take, like, for example, accidents. Uh, it should be a fragility fracture, which is falling from standing height or below, or a spontaneous fracture. Okay. So these um, are the types of fracture we ask them. At what age you start screening for osteoporosis, Dr. Hashima? Usually for the FRAX, we start from age 40 and above. It's not applicable for below age of 40. Um, in some cases, we can see the Z-score, and if there is a secondary cause, we might go an earlier uh, age, but mainly from age 40 and above. And for the DICS, I prefer to do it from 50 and above, as mentioned in the guidelines. Okay. Would thyroxine would be um, a risk factor, the Shema, using thyroxine itself? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. If it is not supervised, some patients just take it to lose weight, for example. Uh, if they overdose, uh, if it is not followed by a regular uh, follow-up with the, their physicians, it might cause uh, osteoporosis. Okay. As you know. Dr. Ali, um, any role of uh, someone asked if there is any effect on prolonged use of antihypertensive statins um, and, oste and osteoporosis, if there is any effect? Well, I think uh, statins in vivo, uh, like outside the human body, they are one of the best uh, drugs to treat uh, osteoporosis and to make the bone stronger. But if you take it in a human being's body, in a clinical trial, they found less of efficacy. So this is a, from the statin point of view, I don't think there is a direct link for uh, or a risk factor to develop osteoporosis or bone health. But uh, statins are important for decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease and the treating of uh, this epidemic disorder. Regarding the other part of antihypertensive medications, uh, usually with different classes, also there is not a direct link to uh, bone uh, health and uh, causing a risk of developing an osteoporosis fracture, as far as I know. Um, since we're talking about medications and their effects, 
What about the use of PPIs? Um, how long a uh, duration of use of PPI you will be concerned of uh, that it might cause any harmful effect? And if there is actually a harmful effect with the uh, chronic use of PPIs? Well, the chronic use of PPI has been studied not merely in osteoporosis, it's been studied for Alzheimer's disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, most of the diseases, PPI has been there. PPI can be taken in some country or even in Kuwait and over the counter or anybody can give it to them. There is a misuse to be, uh, to admit there is a misuse of using uh, proton pulp inhibitor, especially for a longer period, which puts you in risk of changing your gut flora, changing uh, of your human physiology, shall I say. So proton pump inhibitor, there are a uh, risk, but there are not a major risk, to be honest, uh, as we see it in uh, the use of, uh, I mean, patients who's been on it. They, they are in a risky, but not that much risk, or the risk is not higher compared to other uh, medications, compared to a steroid or compared to lack of vitamin D. The other thing is the absorption of uh, adequate calcium and uh, vitamin D if the patient is taking proton pulp inhibitor. So we'd like to replace, uh, space the timing from ingestion of proton pulp inhibitor and taking calcium. So make sure the acidity of the stomach is uh, good enough to absorb the calcium. We can change the calcium formate from calcium carbonate to calcium citrate in such patients just to make sure the absorption is uh, better. Hey, Dr. Ali, someone is asking about the, uh, the side effects, probably, of, uh, of the known uh, therapies for use for osteoporosis, specifically talking about the IVs, uh, so probably the, uh, the, uh, the uh, bisphosphonates IV therapy and the subcutaneous injections, whether probably, I'm not sure if they meant uh, anabolic agents or denosumab. In, in very brief uh, sentences, would you describe just the most common complication that could develop from these uh, medications? So any medication we give to the patient, we ward them from uh, injection site reaction, if they would like to use it in IV or subcutaneous, if they develop any rash, any nausea, any vomiting, just like in any medication. Specifically, let's talk about the IV biphosphonate. We would like to make sure they have adequate vitamin D and calcium to make sure the efficacy of uh, those medications. This is to start with. We would like to make sure the patient has a good uh, kidney kidney function and uh, G, uh, normal GFR, so biphosphonate will not harm them if they have such uh, uh, clinical conditions. Uh, this IV, if the patient has a heart pain, it's not an oral, so different from alendronate, which is an oral intake, which is maybe relatively contraindicated for the GI upset. Some patients, they developed flu-like reaction after uh, the treatment uh, by a couple of days, or even they will delay to a couple of weeks, just like a serum sickness reaction, which is usually a normal uh, reaction for IV biphosphonate. Uh, changing in the uh, uh, changing in some calcium level, vitamin D or magnesium level uh, has been noticed as well after a couple of weeks So for such medication. Just like also the donizumab in injection site reaction. So we'll ask the patient if they have the vial, they keep it in the fridge, they will take it after uh, two or three hours in the room temperature, then they will inject themselves or the registered nurse, they, they, will, they will inject them. Sometimes they will have an injection site reaction. Usually we apply a cold compression, it will be better. Some people, they are allergic to the material, just like an, any material injected in their body. Also, uh, flu-like reactions being noticed, uh, alternation noticed. So this is mainly uh, the precautions or the side effect of such medications. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, would you treat, would you teach your patients how to take the subcutaneous injection? Uh, would you uh, uh, help them to, to, you know, to administer that uh, even at home? Well, we encourage them to do that because uh, the idea of giving them such medication is to reduce uh, their risk of coming to the, end, uh, to the hospital and the hospital uh, in a hospital setting. Most of our patients also who take the biological treatment, they know how to use uh, the subcutaneous pens. They are easy, easy to be used and very accessible. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. Dr. Shema, I might direct this question for you. Um, for, uh, for patients who are gut treated or uh, been evaluated for osteoporosis, um, can you start therapy on patients based on FRAX assessment only? 
Uh, yes, Dr. Thamer, we start, and we actually started many patients on Frax only. As I mentioned, um, we do it, and then we just do DEXA to reassure the patient that after a period of treatment, for example, after two years when we repeat the DEXA to show him that there is improvement, but definitely we start uh, treating with Frax alone. Okay, and um, what you would, um, uh, what you would, uh, uh, if you're in a, try to help a primary care setting, to, um, to establish a care uh, of a screening and diagnosis osteoporosis and then have patients be referred to you uh, in your clinic in Adan Hospital to be treated. How would give an advice to primary care centers of how to screen and then to refer patients? When do you want them to screen? When do you want them to refer patients to you? Uh, we would like them to screen patients at risk, like above the age of 40, if they have a fracture before and for... Uh, uh, following the patient, they can send for us patient like patient with fracture. This is a severe osteoporosis, even if the T-score is normal or the frax is uh, not in the treating zone. But if he have a fragility fracture, uh, we would like them to refer this patient of us, especially in the primary care. They see many elderly patients. Many of them complain of like uh, back pain or decrease in their height. So they can do a lateral uh, vertebral x-ray if the patient gave them history of major fracture, uh, hip, spine, uh, so they can refer this. Uh, having low risk, he can be treated in the family care setting, but in severe cases, moderate cases, they prefer to send them to us. And now we have some primary care. They have uh, denosumab available, so in a good setting, they know how to treat. They can treat uh, these type of patients in the policy. Okay. Um, going back to the same subject with the FRAX um, and also with DEXA scan. Um, so the whole idea of, of um, evaluating patients based on TRASC, FRAX is to capture the clinical um, uh, or the clinical uh, uh, cases or the clinical condition that the patient has and then estimate the risk of fracture based on clinical features. So one of the questions here uh, is it mentions that if you have a DEXA scan result showing a BMD of minus 2.5, uh, which is by WHO criteria of osteoporosis. But uh, based on FRAX, is a low probability for fracture. Would you start treatment? Uh, of course, all these tools uh, cannot replace clinical judgment. So clinical judgment is important. Uh, we need to take a good history from the patient. We need to make sure the DEXA is done probably. Uh, its uh, interpretation is important. Um, the center is done at, uh, if the patient uh, having any fractures before, then of course we will treat this patient, even if the frax is low. Okay. So again, uh, the, 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 uh, the frax um, um, evaluation system does not take away your clinical judgments. So based on the criteria or the recommendation, if, if this score is low, then you don't need to treat even with the minus 2.5, but as you mentioned, if the risk factors are high, or, uh, and, and that most likely will be captured by FRAX uh, with the risk of previous fractures or whatever, uh, then, then the risk would be high, and then you would probably treat the, uh, these patients. Uh, one more question about FRAX, Dr. Shema. What if a patient um, has a rheumatoid arthritis, um, and so we click the rheumatoid arthritis in the FRAX, and if they have diabetes, we also click the rheumatoid arthritis on the FRAX. What if they have both? Uh, if we have both, then we will adjust the, the FRAX risk would be, would be higher. So uh, it would be higher than the, if we have one of them. So even we are not calculating it, but like it will change our judgment about this case. Okay, so we don't have basically a, a, a good value of, um, of estimating as someone with, with two conditions like that, because we just, we don't have the, uh, yeah. the tool to appreciate it. Um, and then it, then it goes back to clinical judgment, basically, as we mentioned so far, is that how much uh, uh, this patient is likely to have a fracture based on what we know about his history, and then evaluate us than that. Uh, Victor Ali, I have a few questions. Uh, um, uh, one of the questions here mentioned is that in patients with MS, uh, they receive um, uh, large doses of steroids, a uh, gram of methyl bread uh, IV for about five days, and, and, they, and they usually have that kind of therapy several times. Um, would that someone would be interesting for, to screen or even to treat for osteoporosis? 
Yes, uh, so, uh, so those patients has two risks. Uh, number one, the risk of large amount of steroid, maybe they will take it intermittently. For example, if I have a rheumatoid arthritis patient on one pill of five milligram prednisolone for 360 days, if you calculate this test, uh, this all dose, and you can put even a bigger dose in MS patients who's been pulsed three or four times a year. So patient who has a high risk of exposure to glucocorticoid, they are a higher risk of developing osteoporosis. Um, plus, we'll go back to the patient itself regarding their age, their sex, their medical conditions, so also they can put their risk together. Still, going back to a clinical judgment, if I do FRAX for those patients who have MS, most of them, they are uh, less than the age of 40, and the FRAX doesn't apply for them. We will follow for the Z score for them. So still, I leave it as a judgment call for a clinician. So the opinion and personalized medicine is most important. Health advocate for such patients for exercise, non-pharmacological uh, smoking cessation, and also adequate calcium, vitamin D is important. But still, some patients, we give them such... Uh, uh, medications. I have patients with vasculitis, which requires a higher dose of steroid compared to uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. Also, we give them some anti-resorbative agents just to protect their bones and to prevent the fractures in the future. I think we only have four minutes, so I think I'm going to leave these four minutes for questions about vitamin D, and I have several questions about vitamin D. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll direct them to you, Dr. Ali. Uh, do you, can you keep maintenance vitamin D for life? Yes, so the idea of keeping vitamin D, if you believe vitamin D is good for your bone, for your health, for your immunity, yes, you can keep it, you can supply it. It's uh, safe to have a range between 75 to 215 an individual. And uh, what about sun exposure and vitamin D? Uh, would you recommend it? Um, duration, exposure time, all these? Well, of course, uh, diet is important, exposure to some 30 minutes uh, per day, but especially here in Kuwait, it's difficult sometimes. Oh, well, most of the year, it's uh, hot and people, they cannot expose the, themselves. But yes, I uh, stress on non-pharmacological, to be honest. And how long you will tell them to stay in the sun? And when, what time of the well, uh, well, I... Uh, I uh, I can't remember, but usually uh, the timing between 9 and 3 to avoid it in uh, 12 noon, uh, just to take it for uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an optimal way of how to do with it. Um, and uh, would you think supplementing vitamin D early, uh, girls or even boys, when they're much younger, during childhood or teenager, do you think it would prevent developing osteoporosis in the future? Yes, uh, adequate vitamin D is important in all ages. Okay, I, I think that's a very sufficient answer. Um, the only thing we don't have so far, I think, is the very long follow-up uh, results of trials uh, describing management with vitamin D deficiency in girls to see if their effects uh, for the long run. But we, we think vitamin D is a crucial vitamin that needs to be adjusted mm -hmm. throughout life. Uh, and we, we, we kind of promote that for the majority of the time. Is I am um, safe? I am vitamin D injection safe, Dr. Ali? Well, we, would, we don't like to use it, to be honest, because this is a large amount. You throw it in the body. So I prefer oral intake or natural, if we'd like to stress on the diet and the sun then supply it by uh, tablets. So in some cases, minority of cases, we give IM injection, which is usually least in our uh, priority. Okay. And I think we can do the last question here. Um, last question would say, let me pick this. Um, how long do you need to treat patients if they are on denosumab uh, as a therapy for osteoporosis? For how long do you need to treat them for on denosumab? So usually I treat them for five years. Uh, I mean, I follow them after two years and I will see. Sometimes I need to stop uh, the treatment if uh, the risks are uh, minimized, if the bone mineral density readings are adequate. So I will happy and I will stop. Maybe I will continue to five years, but after five years, I will see. Shall I change it to another agent? Shall I go for... Uh, 
uh, biphosphonate or I will continue another five years. So usually it's difficult uh, to answer the question, evaluating the patient after two years, then five years. Some people, I kept them up to 10 years. So management of osteoporosis is a chronic condition and majority of the time therapies need to stay for a major uh, long period of time. So I think our time is up. Um, uh, we've already spent an hour talking about presentation, excellent presentations from Dr. Shayma and Dr. Ali. So thank you so much uh, for delivering these messages and this information. We're very thankful. Uh, we're very thankful for Amgen as the supporting group uh, behind uh, setting up this presentations and, um, and the website and the uh, uh, the webinar, thank you so much for the audience also for participation. I still have a lot of questions, but uh, because of the time, sorry we couldn't uh, run through them, but we probably selected the most important ones. So uh, thank you for the audience for attending. Um, I'm sure the uh, uh, certification of attendance will be directed to you um, after the presentation has ended. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Shayma, Dr. Ali, for uh, your forum presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.